皆様、リンク j のライブウェビナーにご参加いただきありがとうございます。本日はリンク j u c サンディエゴ特別ウェビナー、カリフォルニア大学創薬コンソーシアム UCDDC のご紹介、その使命と産学連携についてをお送りいたします。私は本日司会を務めます、リンク j の関と申します。よろしくお願いします。本日は画面でお示ししているプログラムに沿って進めてまいります。ご質問はウェビナーの Q&A 機能からお願いいたします。時間の都合上、すべての質問へのお答えができかねる場合がございます。また、本イベントではウェビナーの同時通訳機能、英語字幕をご利用いただけます。なお、ウェビナー中の録音、録画、画面キャプチャーなどはお控えください。それではリンク J 常務理事曽山と UC サンディエゴ国際アウトリーチディレクター和賀様よりご挨拶いたします。よろしくお願いいたします。はい、あのリンクジェの曽山でございます、えー。日本の皆様おはようございます。えー、米国の皆様、えー、夕方ですね、西海岸の皆様、えー、こ早いですけれども、こんばんは。えー、今日はですね、えー、このウェビナーにご参加いただきまして、誠に、えー、ありがとうございます。えー、ご案内の通りですね、UC サンディエゴ校とリンクジェではですね、えー、これまで、えー、数多くの、えー、そしてさまざまな、えーイベントですね、を UC サンディエゴ校のトップの研究者の方々をお招きしてですね、開催してまいりました。例えばですね、過去半年ぐらいの間でいうと、7回ぐらいですね、ウェビナーですね、UC サンディエゴ校と日本の主要な大学からの研究者の方をお招きして、京都大学、慶応大学、大阪大学等ですね、やってまいりました。またですね、こういう状況情勢ですので、COVID-19 への対応とか対策、えー、UC サンディエゴ校はすごく進んでおります、えー、そういったものもですね取り上げて2回ほど、えー、スペシャルウェビナーを開催してまいりましたそして今回はですね、えー、またスペシャルウェビナーということで、えー、UC、えー、ユニバーシティオブカリフォルニアのシステム全体をですねにおいてですね横断的な組織である、えー、カリフォルニア大学創薬、えー、コ,ンコンソーシアムですね、えー、UCDDC えー、をご紹介してですね、えー、その使命と、えー、産学連携の状況についてですね、えー、取り上げてまいります、えー、具体的にはですね UC スタンディエゴ校のマイケル・ギルソン先生に UCDDC、えー、の全体像についてお話をいただくとともにですね、えー、UCLA、UC リバーサイド、えー、UC バークレー校、えー、それぞれのキャンパスリードを務めていらっしゃる先生方からですね、えー、最新の、えー、創薬関連研究の事例紹介をしていただいて、えー、最後にですね Q&A、えー、そしてディスディスカッションを行ってまいります、えー、そして毎回のことではありますが、えー、このウェビナー、えー、大変ご尽力をいただいているですね、えー、UC サンディエゴ校、えー、オフィスオブリサーチアフェアーズのインターナショナルアウトリーチディレクターである、えー、和賀さん、えー、心より感謝申し上げます、えー、今日もですね、えー、こ,この進行をですねやっていただきます、えー、では和賀さんの方からですねイントロダクションとですねモデレーターの先生のご紹介を、えー、何卒よろしくお願いします和賀さんよろしくお願いしますはい、Thank you, Soyama san, for the welcome remarks.、Uh, I'm Miwako Waga, Director of International Reach at UC San Diego. I am grateful to Link J. Soyama san and his colleagues, as usual, who host joint webinars with us.、Uh, today, I am particularly pleased to present a group of distinguished speakers who conduct cutting edge drug discovery research at several UC campuses. The University of California Drug Discovery Consortium is a cross campus initiative aimed at building a drug discovery community that actively p r o m o t e research translation through industry partnerships. Dr. Michael Gilson, the campus lead at UC San Diego, will give an overview of the UCDDC and then he will moderate three research talks. By campus leads from UCLA, UC Riverside, and UC Berkeley. We have asked each speaker to leave a few minutes at the end of their talk to answer questions from the audience. So please enter your questions in English、uh, into the QA panel.、Uh, now, let me introduce the first speaker, Dr. Michael Gilson. He's a professor and chair in computer aided drug、uh, design at the Skiags School of Pharmacy and the Pharmaceutical Sciences at UC San Diego. He is also co director of、uh, UC San Diego's Center for Drug Discovery Innovation. Dr. Gilson, 
please take the mic. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks to um, everyone at LinkJ for your interest. Uh, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be speaking with you today, even if it is from uh, far away. So let me see if I can share my screen. So as uh, you heard, uh, what I would like to do today is to tell you about a new organization at the University of California, fairly new, called the University of California Drug Discovery Consortium in hopes that this may be of interest to some of you as a basis for collaborations and connections with the University of California. The mission of the UCDDC as written here is to leverage the biomedical research and commercialization strengths of the University of California system, accelerate the discovery of needed therapies and to translate basic science discoveries into commercial enterprises that will stimulate uh, the economy. We work with uh, partners in industry where our value proposition is to provide our partners companies outside the UC with access to what we believe is the largest pool of academic biomedical researchers in the United States. This is the faculty and uh, researchers at the University of California campuses taken together. Uh, the faculty at uh, the University of California are motivated to collaborate with industry and to translate their discoveries into therapies that will solve the most pressing health challenges of the 21st century. The benefits that partners with the, that our industrial partners can gain by working with us are early, fundamentally early access to the latest innovation and the latest discovery in a wide range of biomedical areas related to the development of new therapies. The Drug Discovery Consortium is a single point of entry to the University of California system and its drug discovery resources. It's as far as we know, the only way that an external partner can access um, research across multiple UC campuses through one point of interaction. Uh, we offer um, convenient access, a convenient route to sponsor research at the University of California with pre-negotiated agreements and terms in place that make it easy to start up a relationship uh, we offer project management support for any funded projects and mentoring for those projects. And one of the roles that we play since we have representatives at multiple campuses is the ability to help partners find research that is of interest to their uh, companies at the at University of California. Uh, in a very brief history, uh, the Drug Discovery Consortium is a multi-campus entity that was created by uh, another multi-campus entity, the Biomedical Research Acceleration Integration and Development Group. It was initially supported by a grant from the University of California. And in 2019, we organized the ability to, to bring in private partners, industry partners to connect with us and to connect with our campuses. We bring together seven exceptional University of California campus medical centers as well as the other parts of the campuses, engineering, uh, chemistry, biochemistry, and thousands of faculty that enable you to share resources, that will share resources and expertise. So the campuses are the University of California, Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego, Berkeley, Davis, Irvine, and Riverside. And here you see uh, some rankings, national rankings in terms of biomedical research. Um, of the individual campuses and the number of startups that we produce. And what you can see is that the individual campuses are already highly ranked when you put them all together. This is really a research powerhouse. Um, we have something like 10,000 teaching and research faculty and staff, which have generated hundreds of thousands of publications in biomedical sciences, have published thousands of patents uh, and contributed to the commercialization of many therapeutics. Uh, which have led to FDA approvals. We, faculty across the UCs also play a, a big role consulting with industry and collaboration, and we participate in industry-sponsored clinical trials. 
This is a look at the University of California's innovation pipeline compared to other, other university structures in the United States. So here we have on the left, the number of published patents uh, from zero to 5,000. And we put together these big campuses of the University of California were above University of Texas, MIT, Stanford, Harvard, and so forth. And similarly, if you look at the number of startup companies, uh, University of California is, is exceptional. We also, uh, if you look at the amount of innovation as measured by the number of invention disclosure forms, whatever a faculty member at University of California has an invention, we have to tell our offices about that. There are something like 18,000 of these that have been filed, which is twice that coming from MIT, three times that of Harvard and Stanford and four times that of Harvard uh, and so on. So there's, you put these campuses together and you have something really unique. The, Drug Discovery Consortium itself is led by an executive committee. You can see them here and you have several of us with you. So I'm happy to be hosting um, Robert Damozo, Professor Damozo at UCLA, Professor Julia Shalevsky at University of California, Berkeley and Professor Palekia at University of California, Riverside. And these are our leads at um, UC Davis, UC Irvine and UC San Francisco. And we also work with Jordan Kovacev uh, who is our administrator. So how do we, um, more specifically, how does University of uh, California Drug Discovery Consortium uh, help uh, work with our partners? In particular, what we're able to do is that a partner that we're working with, we can work with you to craft a request for grant proposals that goes out across all the University of California campuses where we work. And we invite submissions from the faculty on these campuses uh, in, in your areas of interest. Uh, we then look these over, we work with you to select projects which are of a high interest. Uh, and this, by sponsoring a project, you get certain intellectual property rights. Um, you also have access, which we help you with, to a database of faculty members and researchers active in specific areas. So if you're interested in immuno-oncology or you're interested in uh, metabolic disease, we can identify the faculty and contact them directly regarding their uh, research in these areas. And these are people who have an interest in collaborating with industry to advance drug discovery through uh, sponsored research and uh, partnering. And at each campus, as you've seen, we have a representative at each participating campus, and that lets us provide personalized assistance, identifying faculty uh, experts in your areas of interest. Uh, we also hold an annual symposium, uh, which brings together the ca campuses. So those who are getting uh, seed grant funding, also na national and international leaders from each campus. And uh, our partners also have the opportunity to participate and network at this. So we've had several of these already. The one, we have one coming up uh, in September at UC Irvine. Um, this is uh, about the seed grants. So uh, when we request proposals, we work with partners to craft a request for applications that expresses the partner's interests. If necessary, we can uh, seek review of some of these proposals um, to get expert uh, input. Uh, the grant applications emphasize the quality of the research, the potential to generate new IP and uh, unmet uh, market needs. Uh, and the whole process is really quite rapid. We can easily do a, uh, a, a request for proposals, receive the proposals, review them. It takes about, uh, we can do this within a several months to get the proposal to generating uh, an award. And we've given out over a uh, million dollars in funding to UC researchers since 2017 through this program. Most of these uh, proposals, most of the seed grants are funded at a level of about um, $75,000, but this is something that can be adjusted upwards if a project needs more funds. And since uh, uh, we were created, we've uh, funded something like, we've received about 250 distinctive proposals uh, and have funded 25. This is a look, and we have more data as well, which I don't have time to show you today, but this is a look at the types of proposals that we get, the different areas. So on the left, you see that many proposals are in oncology, CNS, so neuro, infectious diseases, and so forth. 
And on the right are the different types of medications that people are seeking to de develop. So many of these will be compound screening for small molecules. Uh, uh, many of them will be doing at the med medicinal chemistry stage. Some of them are preclinical and so forth. So we have a, a wide array of uh, projects in terms of therapeutic areas and project stage. Uh, this is a look at the different types of uh, projects on the left. Most of them are aiming to come up with a small molecule therapeutic. Uh, many are also looking for biologics or, or conjugates. And this gives a look at um, where most of the proposals come from. And what you can see is that they're spread almost evenly across the campuses, which is great because it means that you're getting, uh, you're getting uh, proposals from, from the whole array of campuses that are involved. The projects have been successful. This is a look at uh, return on investment. The projects that we funded so far have won uh, over $7 million in follow-on funding in various forms, whether uh, grants, uh, uh, other uh, private funding and so forth. They've led to the foundation of six new companies, 22 articles and multiple patents filed. Uh, and I'll, uh, in the interest of time, I'll uh, skip this uh, diagram on the right. Uh, well, I guess these are, here we're looking at um, percent return on investment across the years. Um, this is a look at the intellectual property generation for campus from the uh, from our proposals from our projects. Uh, you can see that again these are uh, spread across the campuses. The uh, patents filed, out licensing, new companies, and publications. So just to summarize. Um, the value of membership, uh, we think that we offer a lot to um, private companies that want to work with us. This is a way to get early access to innovation across multiple University of California campuses to get uh, a, a, a start on the intellectual property in a wide range of areas. Uh, this is a unique single point of entry into the University of California system for collaborations and partnering opportunities covering thousands of researchers. Um, it's a way to sign one agreement and have access to all the campuses instead of having to negotiate a separate agreement with each different campus. Uh, there's uh, invitations to uh, review meetings and retreats to look at, uh, you have access to the progress reports of the projects that you're funding, um, the right to use these data and reports for internal research, firsthand interactions with our researchers, an invitation to participate in the discussions and the annual symposium and to network with our researchers. Um, this is uh, a little more detail on the costs. To become a corporate partner, the typical fee would be $300,000 a year, of which 80% can immediately be put to sponsored research. So only 20% is administrative. There's also the possibility of becoming a technology partner using in-kind resources. And this fee gets you the uh, ability to hold these sponsored research uh, requests for proposals to sponsor the research and interact with our researchers. Also gets you a uh, first right of refusal for intellectual property generated by these proposals. So I'll wrap up there. Uh, hope that uh, some of you will be interested in this model and we'd certainly be happy to interface with you and discuss further whether uh, this might be something you'd want to pursue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Gilson. Uh, there is one question in the panel. Um, the, uh, the question is, in what cases do you choose to create startups instead of collaborating with established farmers? Mm -hmm. So um, the startups result not from the seed grants that are based on our partners. The way that the Drug Discovery Consortium started was with a large grant from inside the University of California. So we were giving out seed grants from that and that can lead to a new company because it's, it's not tied to a partner. Um, now it's also true that if a partner funds a project and then decides not to pursue it, then again, you could have the possibility of, of a new company, but certainly, our goal is to do work that is of interest to our partners uh, that would lead to uh, further connection and further development with them. 
So uh, this is a question from myself. Uh, because there are so many campuses and there are so many researchers and also research topics, uh, it must be very difficult for any potential partners to identify who and what topics. So if uh, any, any uh, potential partner um, contact one of the, the campus leads, can they lead to uh, an appropriate researchers on other or their campuses? How does this initial contact would work? Mm -hmm. Well, I think what we have found over the years is that the seed grant process is very productive. So we work with a partner to come up with a, a request for proposals that reveals as much as a company is comfortable revealing about perhaps a company is interested in immuno-oncology or something even more specific. Um, that information can be provided to potential uh, faculty who are interested. And then those who are interested can submit a proposal. And what typically happens is that some company, I mean, it's understandable, companies don't want to share all of their interests in detail, but we give a general picture. We send an email to our campuses. So I send an email to the researchers on my campus, for example, giving the general areas of interest and then uh, inviting people to ask me for more information. And then I will reveal more details of, um, of the company interest. And another thing that we can do is that a faculty member may give us a few sentences about their project. I want to, you know, I have an idea for a compound that will be, you know, useful in immuno-oncology and by a certain pathway. I can share that information with the partner and say, is this of interest to you? If so, then a proposal will be written. Um, that's probably the most productive method, but we've also individually gone to research. So each of us knows a lot about the research that's going on on our own campuses. So if the initial request for proposals, you know, maybe we were looking for something different or something more, we can go and contact people directly and say, you know, there's this opportunity, perhaps you'd be interested. And that's also been productive. I see. So uh, there is another question. Uh, do, you do you give opportunity to early stage researcher? I think this means uh, postdoc or um, early career faculty. Um, so uh, faculty members are all eligible to submit proposals. Postdoctoral fellows uh, would have to be working with a faculty member to be eligible because they don't have they don't have control over space. They don't have all the rights you would need to uh, to run a project at the university. So, but they, if they work with a faculty, so we have gotten proposals where a postdoc is maybe had the idea and is leading it, but then they're working with a, a faculty member and certainly younger faculty uh, certainly would, would work with. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So you also mentioned that there, there will be an annual symposium in September. And uh, do you plan to do it in person or a virtual format? This will be hybrid. So uh, we, we uh, <laughs> It normally has been in person. Uh, last year, we didn't hold it at all for obvious reasons. And this year, um, the University of California has been very active at getting faculty and staff vaccinated. And um, so it will be a hybrid meeting. So this uh, meeting is uh, uh, only uh, uh, members are eligible to attend or is any part of the symposium open to the general public? Um, it's not open to the general public, um, but if there's somebody who is interested in attending, they should contact me or anyone else on the committee and we'll see what we can do because we are, you know, the member, it's the members, it's our partners who, of course, have a place there, but we're also interested in connecting with other people, so. Okay, so those who are interested in should go to the UCDDC website and, uh, and find uh, contact information. Uh, you know, email, you know, for e your email or other addresses and yes. just get in touch with you and others uh, and express interest to yes. uh, attend uh, virtually. Yeah, and then we'll, we'll see what we can do. It would, be, it would be new for us, but we'd certainly like to be welcoming. Okay, thank you. <laughs>
Um, how about the interest in infectious disease, uh, diagnostics, and therapeutics? There certainly are people working in those areas uh, at UC. Uh, we have a database of um, faculty and their research interests. So uh, if there was a specific inquiry, you know, this is something that we could look into and give some reports on. I don't know it and I don't have numbers uh, in my head, but we've done this before working with people who are considering joining to give them some numbers about what, how much work is going on in their areas of interest. So again, if somebody wants to contact me or any of us, we can start to helping with that information. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, um, in the interest of time, and also uh, that's the end of the uh, questions from the audience, uh, I, I'd like you to go to the uh, next session, which is the research talks. However, before that, I just want to encourage the audience to send us questions if they have, and of course, for the rest of the, the session, but also even after the webinar about any questions that they might have about the, the, the consortium so that we can continue the, the conversation. So uh, with this, I'd like to uh, close the uh, little Q&A session for your talk. And I would like you to take over and uh, start the research session, please. Thank you so much. And yeah, let me add that um, indeed, there is a, a website for the University of, Drug Dis of California Drug Discovery Consortium with contact information. You should feel free to contact any of us to find out more. Ask uh, Professor Palekia to unmute himself and turn on his video. Uh, and uh, Okay, there you are. So maybe you can start sharing screen uh, while I introduce. So I'm happy to introduce Professor Maurizio Palekia. He's Professor of Biomedical Sciences at the University of California Riverside School of Medicine, where he is the founding director of the Center for Molecular and Translational Medicine and the, uh, has an endowed chair in cancer research, cancer research. His research focuses on new approaches uh, to drug discovery in oncology and neurodegeneration. And his work has led to multiple follow-on translational efforts in uh, the biotech sector. Uh, Dr. Palekia, please start. We're, I'm not hearing you right now, so I'm not sure. Okay, I was thanking you, Mike, and I, I was erroneously <laughs> still muted. Okay, good. Um, so in, I, I, I'm, in the interest of time, I just go diving directly in what we do, which is uh, looking at therapeutically viable protein-protein interactions and trying to find ways to um, attack them chemically so that we can have pharmacological tools and eventually therapeutics. Um, the field is still at its infancy, as you know, but we do have a drug approved for a protein-protein interaction that is the Abbott-1, ABT-199, which was approved in 2016. Now, when I look at the protein-to-protein -protein interaction, it's not truly what is depicted here, like two proteins hugging one another. It's mostly one protein functioning as a receptor and the second protein functioning as a ligand and this ligand could be under the shape of one uh, loop or maybe a beta strand, like in this case, or maybe an alpha helix. And I just want to show you that in each of those cases, we can find chemical matter, potential chemical probes, or even therapeutics that they can mimic those interactions. So I want to start with the first one um, that I'm particularly proud of because I believe we can make a big difference in the field of ALS by devising a molecule that mimics the interactions between the EPHA4 and this natural ligand, the ephrin. So um, the EPHA4 receptor is expressed in motor neurons and with an unknown mechanism when it's in unbound form, so it's not bound to its ligand, as a pro-apoptotic activity. So it causes motor neurons to be very susceptible to any external stimulus to die. And that seems to be particularly deleterious in ALS patients. On the contrary, when the receptor is coupled with these natural ligands, the ephrine ligands, this activity is no longer shown. Um, 
Structurally, the ectodomain, so the part that is exposed on the outside of the modern neurons um, of the EPHA4 structure has been solved. And in the APO form, the ectodomain looks like this. And when the efferin ligands, that they usually come from adjacent cells or can also interact in cis, so it means from the same cell, um, they cause the dimerization of the domain. Um, so what we are trying to mimic then is the efferin ligand with a small molecule. And what these efferin ligands need to do, need to not only mimic this interaction, but also elicit the same function. So they have to induce the dimerization of the domain and act therefore as agonistic. So how do we do that? Um, we develop an approach over the year, which is based on a combination of combinatorial library design and screening with using a sensitive biophysical methods such as NMR spectroscopy in particular, and that help us to identify out of a very large libraries of combinatorial uh, compounds, those elements that they seem to have the highest affinity for the target. Therefore, we can then synthesize individual compounds and test them. And this work was published uh, a few years back that led to the discovery of this uh, earlier prototypic molecule called 123C4. So if we look at the chemical structure of 123C4 and compare it to what you could obtain by other techniques, such as phage display, for example, we notice immediately that our molecule is in this agonistic. And that's what we wanted. We wanted to mimic the efferin ligands. Um, without going in too many details, the way we recognize that structurally is using a combination of X-ray crystallography, where we compare the structure of the unbound ligand binding domain with the ligand binding domain bound to an efferin ligand. This is just a portion of the efferin ligand. And we combine that with other biophysical methods such as selective labeling and NMR spectroscopy. In particular, we use C13-methionine labeling. So all this to tell you that we can actually predict what type of conformational changes the inhibitor is inducing in the ligand binding domain that they can be directly then correlated with the agonistic activity of the ligands. And that is particularly enabling because we can then take, for example, important structural activity relationships um, elements such as this N terminal free amine seems to be very important, and then further optimize those molecules to make them into drug like compounds with proper pharmacological properties. This evolution is summarized here in one slide um, with this molecule now 150D4, which we called Ephralex, as the first in class agonistic EPHA4 targeting agent. Uh, for which we got all kinds of data, as you can imagine, including the X-ray structure of the complex with the ligand binding domain of the EPHA2. Um, this is a complex slide that shows some of the biological properties of this molecule. But in essence, what this slide wants to show you that this molecule truly can mimic the same effects as the endogenous efferin ligands of the EPHA4. So it's a truly good mimetic, even a low concentration. Most importantly, we could do these experiments with the Catherine Meyers lab at the Nationwide Children's Hospital in Ohio, that she's able to obtain um, um, astrocytes uh, derived from ALS patients and co-culture them with modern neurons and show that they are very toxic and that toxicity can be, revert, uh, can be reverted, excuse me, by exposing the cells to Ephralex to 150D4. So the molecule is cytoprotective to modern neurons also in these difficult conditions uh, uh, due to uh, activated astrocytes from ALS patients. So using this approach, therefore, we can go from a very complex drug target, if you think about this, a cell-cell interaction drug target or a protein-protein interaction drug target, uh, all the way to a molecule that can be uh, potentially developed into a therapeutic. And we are working with Alcyon Life Sciences in Boston to make the leap from the laboratory to the clinic. A second um, um, example I want to show deals with this uh, protein SMAC, ZIAP, in apoptosis, so in oncology, for which, for example, Novartis has developed this molecule LCL161. 
Um, without going too much into the, uh, the biology of SMAC uh, mimetics or XIAP antagonists, those molecules, uh, the IAP proteins, they just prevent cancer cell death. So if we can derive molecules that block those proteins, we can free uh, cancers, um, uh, cancer cells from, um, from this break that those proteins um, uh, have on, the, on their apoptotic process. So we published several papers, so it will take too long to summarize our efforts. I just want to go to the essence of what we have been trying to do. And the essence is summarized here. We want to design inhibitors of protein-protein interactions that they target covalently lysine, tyrosine, or histidine residues, because those are nucleophilic residues that can be attacked by the proper electrophiles and therefore parallel what the industry is doing in targeting cysteine residues with acrylamides. So we have been interested in probing uh, fluorosulfates, as shown here, or sulfonyl fluorides, as possible electrophiles for these amino acids. And to do that, we use the XIAP uh, BER3 domain as a model system, and we introduce these single point mutations to mimic the presence of a tyrosine of the histidine, and the lysine is already there in the wild type. So we ask some very basic questions about those electrophiles, which are, can, can we use sulfonyl fluorides or fluorosulfates for covalent protein-protein interactions targeting ligands? And therefore, are those molecules, uh, they react efficiently and selectively with those amino acids? Most importantly, are those, able, uh, are those agents then suitable as a chemical props or possible pharma pharmacological tools? Therefore, are those stable in buffering media, they're permeable, do they engage with the targeting cell? And then ultimately, to be uh, suitable as possible therapeutics, we need to do some in vivo pharmacokinetics, stability and bioavailability studies as well. So uh, to study these type of molecules, we do a battery of assays that include simple uh, biochemical assays at different incubation times to measure KI and K-inact. Uh, we can also measure the naturation thermal shifts uh, or we can also measure the stability of the molecules, of course, using STS gel, for example, we can detect if the molecule is covalently bound. Uh, we can use mass spectrometry to verify the covalent agent is stably bound and irreversibly to the target. As I mentioned, we also use X-ray crystallography to understand the geometry of the bound ligand. And, and eventually then we go in cell-based assays where we can measure cellular denaturation thermal shifts, and in the case of this particular target, apoptosis and sensitization to an external stimulus such as TNF-alpha. And then ultimately, as I mentioned, we want to measure uh, admi um, uh, tox properties uh, in, uh, in mice. So this work, I just can give you an example of the several papers we published culminated into this compound 142D6 that is a first-in-class pan-IAP antagonist that is covalent with all, uh, against all the uh, uh, IAP family proteins. And we can demonstrate that in a variety of assays, including the cellular thermal shift assay, that is actually engaging in cell directly covalently binding to one of the targets. Most importantly, it's in uh, a variety of cell lines and cell experiments, the molecule behaves as well as the clinical candidate LCL161 from Novartis, which is not irreversible, including uh, breast cancer cell lines, for example. I think what the striking uh, piece of data came when we went to uh, study those molecules in vivo. And the most important uh, take home message is that these uh, fluorosulfates, that they can be very good electrophiles for lysine in particular, they seem to be um, um, orally bioavailable which is pretty remarkable. So the molecules are very, very stable. In fact, the low pH as we studied in the laboratory and they are orally active and orally bioavailable. And, and as I mentioned, they're very, very active against in particular this triple negative uh, breast cancer cell line at least as good or better than LCL161. And we are now in the process of uh, running tumor xenograph studies. And this molecule is part of our Mida Labs, a new venture that is uh, uh, aimed at developing those molecules to the clinic. What about uh, fluorosulfates uh, uh, are very good. What about sulfonyl fluorides? Uh, sulfonyl fluorides tend to be too reactive as, as this picture is gonna show you. 
uh, we were able to tame them. So to have find the right balance between the reactivity and selectivity of those molecules. And uh, to do that, we found some uh, proper substitutions and we were able to incorporate some of those molecules in um, uh, agents that they seem to be also very uh, potent, cell permeable and active, or whether there's a variety of other sulfonylfluorides that we intend to investigate. Um, just to conclude, uh, I want to show very briefly an example of an alpha helix mimetic that is covalent using those strategies. This is one single slide. We just published this work um, about a month ago where we could really identify a selective and potent alpha helix mim mimetics that is covalent and we could solve the crystal structure of those molecule. And this is the first in class uh, MCL1 antagonist that is covalent and exquisitely selective for uh, this target. So we envision that those strategies can be combined in general methods to identify potential antagonists uh, to protein-protein interactions. And I would like to um, take any questions. And those are the folks in the lab that have helped uh, carrying out the experiments I have been showing. Thanks so much. Uh, officially, time is up. But if there's a, a question or two, we can try to answer those quickly, I think, if that's OK with uh, Ms. Waga. Sure, please. OK, well, I'm not seeing any right now. So let me start introducing our, our last speaker. But if people can type their questions, then we may still get to some things. So thank you again, uh, Professor Kalekia. I want to introduce our, our third and last speaker for, the, uh, for your morning, I guess, um, Dr. Julia Shaletsky. Dr. Shaletsky earned her doctorate with Professor Tom Rappaport at Harvard Medical School uh, and HHMI. She then spent 11 years in industry discovering and developing first-in-class medicines that have gone to clinical trial for heart disease and neurodegenerative disorders. She's currently at the University of California, Berkeley, where she directs the Henry Wheeler Center for Emerging and Neglected Diseases, whose mission is to work globally against, uh, against these, uh, these problems. She also directs the Immunotherapy and Vaccine Research Initiative and the Drug Discovery, uh, Drug Discovery Center there, and teaches bioentrepreneurship at our School of Business, uh, where she's advised many successful startups from inception through IPO. Uh, Dr. Shaletsky, uh, it's yours. Thank you so much, Mike, for this kind introduction, and thank you for the opportunity um, to speak here today to the organizers and welcome to Japan. Uh, I have I haven't been there for a lot, for a while. When I was in the private sector, I used to work with Astellas and had the good fortune of uh, being there every six months uh, in Tsukuba, uh, close to Tokyo. It has always been a very pleasurable experience. So welcome everybody. I'm going to share. Um, my presentation with you. All right. And today I'm going to talk about a project just as an example of, of what we work on with the Drug Discovery Center at UC Berkeley. Um, the previous speakers have done an excellent job at highlighting uh, the capabilities within the UC Drug Discovery Consortium. And I'm just going to give one example of a project that we have run um, during the COVID pandemic. So um, when the pandemic emerged, we realized it would be great to do um, a screen to find repurposed drug candidates for coronavirus. Um, and for to that end, we conducted a campaign with a colleague of mine, Professor Sarah Stanley, who has access to a biosafety level three laboratory, um, which is a, a relatively rare thing to have. And together with our library and drug discovery infrastructure, uh, we were able to rapidly put together a phenotypic screen um, of SARS-CoV-2 survival and replication, and then look at combinatorial assays um, to look at repurposed compounds to inhibit um, viral activity. Um, so we have this library of FDA approved compounds that we used and we were leveraging this because it could be in 
prescribed immediately by physicians off label. We ran an assay in the biosafety level three with SARS CoV 2 infected cell lines um, to identify relevant compounds. And we've, we wanted to focus on compounds active in human lung epithelial cells, which in the beginning of the pandemic, few people were using. Um, so one idea, so we did several campaigns. The one I'm talking about today is um, an, the idea to enhance activity of an existing drug candidate, remdesivir, which has in the meantime been FDA approved as the sole therapeutic for um, COVID-19. And we, we wanted to take remdesivir and see if we can make it better because it does work, but it works not very well. So we were trying to improve activity. And for that, um, we came up with the idea of an unbiased screen for synergistic combinatorial therapies. Um, the idea was to screen in presence of low concentrations of remdesivir and then add um, approved drugs to that and see which ones might synergize uh, with remdesivir. This is different from what generally was done. Several groups were looking at synergy, but mostly um, they would take the best compounds from different screens and then combine those. Um, our assay here was different because we were unbiased. We just looked at presence of remdesivir um, and then brought in co all compounds that we were testing, opening the door to finding molecules that on their own might not actually do much, but with remdesivir might synergize. Um, so this slide shows the assay. We were cultivating cells and then in concentration of low amounts of remdesivir um, and then would treat um, with the virus, infect with virus and treat either with DMSO or with the drug. And if you have the virus there and you don't do anything, you just treat with DMSO, um, you see that the cells shrivel up and die. And if you have an effective drug preventing uh, viral activity, then the cells look healthy. And that difference can be read out um, in um, an assay measuring residual ATP content um, in these cells. And that's what our difference was between uninfected cells and infected cells. Um, and we got very nice C primes for this. This was already in presence of IC15 of remdesivir. So homogeneous luminescence-based assay, uh, very straightforward to run, which was important because it was in the biosafety level three. Um, our par par parad uh, paradigm went through primary screens. Initially, we used monkey cells because they were most permissible to infection um, early in the process, but later we confirmed with human lung cells and then did dose response and validation. So I'm just walking you through some of the data. Um, here is the primary screen data uh, in the initial monkey cell screen. We used um, uh, we compared both with completely without remdesivir, just the regular screen where you try to do a repurposing screen against SARS-CoV-2. And this is 100% inhibition of cytopathic effect. So a compound that works extremely well would be found here close to 100. Zero indicates there is no effect. Um, and what you can see here is that if you just screen the library directly, it's very few compounds that have activity. Um, and that's consistent with what other labs observed. It's just a handful. Remdesivir is still the best of the bunch. Um, however, if you treat with a small amount of remdesivir, you begin to identify an entire group of compounds um, that are on their own, not efficacious, but together with remdesivir, highly potent, and those are marked in red. Um, here we just tested toxicity, they're all non-toxic. Um, and then we compared, we repeated that data, we got more than 95% um, confirmation rates for that, which is very good. Um, and critically, the critical experiment here is the comparison of results in the monkey kidney cells, Vero E6, and in the human cells, KLU3. And what you can see here is the red compounds um, correlate nicely between two cell lines. And 
we pursued those moving forward. And we've also found out in our studies um, that it's really critical um, to um, confirm activity in several cell lines because um, many screening hits that were found and published are in fact only working in one type of cell line. And that um, puts you at a disadvantage for the follow-up. So in order to understand more why these compounds work together with remdesivir, we uh, looked at a synergy model. The way you do this is you do a dose response of both remdesivir and the other drug, and you have all the combinations of concentrations on one plate. And there's a computer model that you can use to cal calculate um, a, a score of synergy um, that allows you to, to see if the, if the effect is truly synergistic, which is that the joint effect is more than the addition of the individual effects, um, or if it's additive. And a zip score that can be derived of greater than 10 means it's synergistic. So here's the data just as an overview that we, we got from this. Um, this is a three-dimensional um, plot of, val of bo both remdesivir and valpadesivir and all the different combinations. And you can see that remdesivir on its own is not very active. Um, valpadesivir was the drug we found, hepatitis C drug, um, also not very active on its own. But once you combine them together, you easily get 100% inhibition of the virus. And this is just a different display of the same thing. Here's the dose response of remdesivir up to 10 micromolar. You see a nice dose response. Well, powders were alone really not much of an effect at all. But once you combine it together, um, you see that the remdesivir becomes more and more potent. And this data shows you the quantitative uh, measurement of synergy scores over this interface. And you can see that there's a clear um, area where synergy is present with a zip score of 85, which is much higher than 10 what's required. Um, and if you slice this three-dimensional data set um, to look at um, the dose response curves. This is just one visualization that shows you remdesivir dose response alone. And then once we use valpadesivir in combination and also com combination of another drug that we found, um, we can actually improve um, the EC50 uh, by a factor of 30 fold. And this becomes now um, a nanomolar drug. Um, interestingly, just very briefly, this is also true for other, for other hepatitis C drugs uh, that have the same mechanism than valpadesvir. Valpadesvir was the strongest one, but there's also uh, one made by Merck uh, called Elbasvir that was in the library that basically showed the same effect. We have, in the meantime, repeated this with all NS5A inhibitors that are available, and they all show this. So this is a class effect. Um, the, that level of synergy with remdesivir. And just very briefly, uh, some follow-up data, because all the data I've shown you so far was from the original screening assay, homogeneous cell titer glow assay. Um, and we confirmed this in several other uh, orthogonal assays. Um, for example, here we looked at uh, the TCID50, which gives you the viral infectious particles in the supernatant of these cells. And you can see that if you treat, if you don't treat the cells, there's a lot of viral particles here, more than a million. Um, if you add just remdesivir alone, a low concentration, not much is happening. If you look at valpadesivir alone, also not much inhibition. But once you combine remdesivir and valpadesivir, you have a significant reduction that gets really close to the um, detection limit in this assay. And the same is true if you look at it looking in immunofluorescence and also in the RT-PCR readouts. And the upper panel shows you the data with valpadesivir and the lower one with albasvir. So it's true for both of them. And to just go briefly through um, the immunofluorescence assays, um, here you can see the cells stained with DAPI for the nuclei in blue, and red is the nucleocapsid protein of SARS-CoV-2. And if you just treat with DMSO, you see evidence of infection, the cells are red, 
Um, if you treat with valpatasvir alone, you also see um, a lot of infection there. Um, and then if you have remdesivir alone, it's not re removing infection completely, but once you combine remdesivir with valpatasvir as shown here, um, the cells look practically indistinguishable um, from uninfected cells. Why is this relevant? We were excited about this because there is some evidence that um, one thing that limits remdesivir activity uh, in patients is that the concentration of active metabolite in the lung is too low relative to the IC50 um, that is there. Um, so the idea is if you can shift the EC50 um, and you would get potentially better efficacy in patients and also would allow us to treat more people with the limited remdesivir doses that are being manufactured and reduce the probability of resistance development. How does this work? Um, just a quick um, overview of the mechanism that we've now um, shown, you know, have, have discovered. Initially, we didn't know really how it worked, but we had a hypothesis that turned out to be correct based on mass spec data that our collaborator at Columbia University has, uh, has gathered. Um, so when the virus is treated with remdesivir, um, you get a problem with RNA synthesis. It's similar like putting a, a coin of the wrong uh, currency into, you know, into a, a vending machine. You can get the coin in and then at some point the machine will jam. And what the virus can do, it has a proofreader, an exonuclease that can help spit the coin back out and return the coin so it can still keep working, um, making its transcripts. But what our compounds do, um, the NS5A inhibitors that we found like Valpatasvir, um, they actually inhibit this proofreader, the exonuclease, and therefore the virus can't defend itself against um, these molecules like remdesivir as, effic as effectively. And that's also the reason why we don't see activity without remdesivir because the proofreader is not really needed unless you challenge um, the virus with remdesivir. And once you have remdesivir there, it becomes critical um, for us to, to take out the proofreader. And like that, we can really kill the virus um, and make remdesivir much more efficacious. All right, so we're working on a data package supporting progression into the clinic. I'll be working on um, inhalation modality potentially for this and uh, also animal data because one problem is exposure to this drug is not very high in the blood. Uh, so we need to get enough into, into the body to see the effect of synergistic action. All right, and this is the team that I've worked together with this on, on and um, it's just one of several projects that we involved with, with the Drug Discovery Center and uh, the UC Drug Discovery Consortium. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much. So um, th that was great. So uh, we're actually, I think, into the, um, the general Q&A, which was really for, um, you as well as Dr. Demazo and Palenkia or, or me. So um, if there are questions for Dr. Shaletsky or for others, I see some in the, um, <coughs> the Q&A, there's one for you. To Professor Shaletsky, remdesivir should be used before vaccination as a prevention <coughs> or after that for severe infection. After vaccinating, there is possibility of getting an infection. So currently remdesivir is used um, as a, for severe infections and it is given um, intravenously because it's not orally possible to, to take it. So it only is given to the sickest patients. Um, and that, that's a problem because as an antiviral, you want to treat as early as possible in order to stop the virus from replicating. Um, when you're already in the hospital and you have severe problems, 
it's kind of late in the game. So um, it would be much better to treat early and there is trials currently underway with remdesivir for inhalation for that reason, because the intravenous administration really limits how early you can reach patients because you have to be basically in a doctor's office to get treated. Thank you. So there are two other questions. I'm not sure who they're directed to. Um, maybe the person who posed them, people who posed them would like to clarify, but one of them is, uh, I would like to ask, what is the key component for a successful in vivo experiment for drug development? Um, uh, injection molecules as much as possible. So I'm not sure I fully understand that question, but maybe somebody else uh, would want to give that a shot. All right, I can try. <laughs> well, when, when, we, when we go in vivo, um, you know, we look at the various things. It depends on the indication, of course, in oncology. Um, you, you could get away with a little bit more toxicity, as you know. In our particular case, in case that question was addressed to me, um, having covalent inhibitors has a lot of advantages over non-covalent compounds. The relationships between pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics in a reversible molecules versus a covalent molecules are very different, as you know. So in that case, um, you know, it, it would take too long to go to a full pharmacology um, summary, but you know, we look at volume of distribution, we look at maximum um, concentration that we get in plasma after different routes of administration. And then you pick the one that gives the best um, um, outcome, depending on uh, your cell-based cell assays. We also tend to eliminate xenografts as much as possible, frankly. Uh, we are working with 3D spheroids to assess efficacy, and then we go straight into uh, mice, uh, or nude mice orthotopic models that they reflect more uh, the disease directly. So I don't know if I answered your question, but it's a very complex question that would take a lot of time to answer it properly, I think. Does anyone else want to chip in on that one? Or? Well, the, uh, the next question is also an interesting one. It's really a very uh, IP question. Do you file a single compound patent for a selected compound? Is there no concern that the pharmaceutical company will develop a similar compound that escapes the patent? So this is for somebody, uh, maybe we should have somebody in from a Okay, I think, I think Mike, Mike froze. So I, uh, I don't know, Julia, you want to give a shot yeah, to this one? <laughs> sure. Um, so since we, this is a this is a complex question. Um, since we work with commercially available compounds, um, we tend to file mostly use patents as opposed to composition of matter patents, which is what a pharmaceutical company would file as late as possible, actually just before they publish or submit initial new drug application to the FDA. Um, normally, so. There is a possibility that you can get around a patent and bust the patent and indeed many companies engage in that. Um, but uh, for us, what we see mostly being in the academic sector is that companies actually like to license um, the IP for the chemical matter because the universities um, make very reasonable um, requests for licensing contracts. So it's for a company a good way to get um, you know, legal security around that license um, and just license it for modest fee. Um, or we also see startups sometimes emerging um, who you know, founded by um, the people who were on the project and then license that um, IP. Ultimately, they will develop, uh, even though they have licensed, they will improve the compound and the, the compound that goes into the clinic might look very different from the original license. And um, then they will have their own patent for that, but they will just continue to pay you know, for the use patent, um, the fees that, that were agreed upon. But we see actually 
On the IP side, um, this is something that has worked quite well, I, I think, for the field because the, the contracts are reasonable. And so for somebody who spins a company out or a pharmaceutical partner, we do also industry sponsored research where um, we can work with a company and um, it's, it's secret. But then once we have a compound, the, um, the industry partner has the right to look at the structure and decide if they want to file a patent or if they want to license it. Um, and like that, you know, you can secure some IP and then do the rest of the medicinal chemistry exploration in the company. All right, I hope that answers it. I'm not sure if Mike, Michael is back. I think Mike is frozen. Yeah, let me Michael see. Michael is frozen again. I, but, but if I look at the time, we are precisely at the next step, which is concluding remarks. Thank you for uh, uh, doing the MC. Uh, uh, I, I wish we can uh, find uh, Mike again. I think I'm back. Can you ah, see okay, me? great, great. Thank you <laughs> yeah, very sorry much. about that. Yeah, so uh, it was a very uh, productive Q&A. Uh, there are a few questions that were asked uh, in the uh, Q&A box, uh, but it seems that um, uh, the question can be uh, answered uh, after the event. So, um, uh, well, with uh, this, uh, I'd like to conclude the research talks session, and I'd like to thank all the speakers uh, for their uh, informative uh, presentations. And uh, special thanks to uh, Dr. Gilson, who made it possible to organize this special webinar. And it was truly a pleasure to work with uh, distinguished speakers at various UC campuses. It's, you know, we, this doesn't happen very often, but I'm really looking forward to do more because, you know, it's, it's wonderful to to know that what is happening in the entire uh, UC system. So thank you very, very much for your uh, participation. And uh, 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 if the audience have any questions, further questions uh, or inquiries about the industry partnerships at the UC DDC, uh, please do not uh, hesitate to contact me at mwaga at ucsd.edu or link j at contact at link hyphen j dot org. And now uh, with this, uh, let's have Soyama-san give his closing remarks. はい、あの、日本語でやらせていただきます。え、皆様ありがとうございました。あの、特にですね、あの、素晴らしい先進的な取り組みをご紹介いただいたですね、え、先生方、え、ダマシア教授、え、そしてえ、シャレスキー教授、え、ペレチア教授、本当にありがとうございました。え、で、さらにはですね、え、あの、皆様のプレゼンの内容、え、お届けの内容を聞いてですね、私個人としても非常に勇